Hello, welcome to everybody who just joined us. We're going to go ahead and be starting at 6.05, so take a couple of moments, settle in, and uh, we'll start shortly. Thank you. Tuesday on my dick, flip flop, flippy flip flopping ass bitch. Fan me off, watch my wrist go click. Fan me off, I'm hot, hot, hot like stolen shit. Hi to everyone who just joined us. We'll be starting at 6.05 in just a moment. Thank you for waiting. All right, it's 6.05, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Folks will check the lane, so we'll just um, go ahead and get uh, the presentation rolling because we have a great one for you all today. So hello, welcome uh, to our Central Valley Scholars post-grad webinar. Today is our medical school webinar, and my, hi, my name is Kiran. I'm the data analysis director. I'll be here to co-host, but I almost... Most of the presenting will go to the wonderful Hector, who I will be introducing a bit later. Um, I'm gonna start off by doing a quick land acknowledgement. Um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge where we are and that the earth below our homes and below our feet is Yokut's territory here in Fresno, where Central Valley Scholars is centered and has been belonged to and been tended to by the Yokuts people for hundreds of thousands of years. When white settlers arrived to what we otherwise know as the United States, they enacted genocide and theft of the land, labor, resources, attempting to wipe out indigenous communities entirely. It's important to acknowledge the land that we are living on and to recognize our history and relationship to the ongoing legacy of colonization in the U.S. and also recognize that the Yokuts people are still here and through resilience and resistance are still on the front lines struggling for land rights, collective liberation, and an end to white supremacy. I invite you all to take a moment and think about the relationship to your land and its history. I'll go ahead and be dropping a link in the chat to um, a great resource called uh, native-land.cab, which is centered around understanding what native tribes land you're occupying. Um, so yeah, please take a moment and uh, just to continue understanding that struggle and form us in where we're going and together we can imagine and collectively build a world in which we are all free. So thank you all for that. Um, for those who don't know about CVS or Central Valley Scholars, we're a community-based organization led by first-gen queer students of color with a mission of creating accessible pathways 
towards higher education for historically underserved communities in the Central Valley. Our strategy focuses on creating critical, conscious, and realistic perspectives on higher education and with emphasis on how systemic forms of oppression affect underserved students' academic trajectories. Excuse me. CVS fosters uh, equity by providing workshops, scholarships, uh, mentorships, which are our version of mentorships, and specialized programming to help students achieve the education they deserve. If you want any information about uh, some of the research that we have listed here and many more, please visit our website at centralvalleyscholars.org. Before I go ahead and introduce our uh, panelists slash workshop lead today, I want to take a moment to say that if you have any questions, please go ahead and click on the Q&A button at the bottom, write your questions in, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end where Hector will be able to answer all your questions. So today our host is Hector Gonzalez, who uses the he, him series of pronouns. Uh, Hector was raised in McFarland, California, also known as the heart of agriculture. Beginning at 15 years of age and extending through his college summers, Hector worked as a manual farm laborer harvesting grapes through the California Central Valley. Through his, this experience, he took note of the significant health disparities faced by the predominantly Hispanic and Latinx labor force, farm labor workforce, where this population experienced disproportionate levels of diabetes and hypertension. He attended the University of Southern California, where he received his BS in public health. As a current medical student and aspiring physician, Hector seeks to leverage his medical education and cultural upbringings to connect with the vulnerable populations that have historically had low levels of healthcare engagement. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the mic to Hector. All right, Kitten, thank you so much um, to Central Valley Scholars, Kitten, um, Katia, and the entire team here. Um, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, I have a, um, a bit of a uh, uh, just a supplemental introduction to get in's great um, um, introduction to myself but um so again i also want to thank everyone who's registered for this webinar um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here i'm actually um, i'm uh, zooming in from palo alto where i'm actually currently at stanford medicine um, but um, i want to take this time to uh, talk a little bit more about myself and my story because in, during the process of applying, it's important to know who you are and also uh, be able to internalize the life experiences that have uh, kind of directed you to, down this long, tedious path of becoming a physician. So uh, my trajectory hasn't been linear. And for that reason, I've kind of I've outlined five pictures in a circle to kind of exemplify uh, my path in medicine, how um, even throughout all the experience that I've been up to this point, I still feel an attraction and a sense of gravity back to the place that I was uh, grew up in. And that's the first picture up at the top. Um, as uh, Gideon mentioned, I'm from McFarland, California. Um, it's a rural farming community. My grandfather emigrated here um, back um, about in the 1960s through the Bracero program. And um, I lived on a ranch, a really small ranch on the outskirts of town. Um, for those who don't know, McFarland is not only medically underserved, but it's also severely economically um, under-resourced. For me, growing up in McFarland, uh, those factors were exacerbated by the fact that um, I was predominantly raised by my grandmother, um, who had a third grade education and who only spoke Spanish. Um, that being said, if we move to the picture to the right, I, that's the Central Valley. And I chose this picture because it, it exemplifies the luscious, green, beautiful um, agriculture that we have here. Um, I actually picked grapes at 15 years old and my grandfather um, was actually, he started off picking grapes as well when he first emigrated, worked his way up to being a contractor and then a farmer. So as much as I wanted to, you know, follow him in the truck with the AC on and the music blasting, he said, nope, if you, uh, you know, want to make money, you have to start from the bottom. So that's the reason why I ended up um, spending a lot of my summers picking grapes. Um, and it was actually looking back at those experience. I, it's been one of the most um, impactful uh, of, of them all, given that it, through this experience, I unfortunately saw um, the great degree and prevalence of chronic disease, specifically diabetes, obesity, and hypertension that disproportionately impacts the immigrant farm working and Hispanic Latinx community all across the Central Valley and others as well. And um, I saw here that chronic disease is multi-generational. So you have families that, you know, work in the fields, uh, mothers and sons, and they each, you know, they struggle from intergenerational poverty and they both have um, obesity and diabetes. So uh, I saw an opportunity to break the cycle. Uh, many people in the Central Valley, um, 
tend to want to leave when they get the chance. And I totally understand that. But for me, it's always been, uh, um, I've always, ha always had in the back of my mind to be able to return. Um, and when I would return, I want to be able to have the tools and resources to be able to give back and make an impact. And one of those was, as we transitioned to the third picture on the bottom right, um, I uh, was accepted and I ended up um, going to USC for undergrad. Um, I was actually admitted to undergrad in 2013 um, as an English pre-med major and I felt like studying English it still didn't have enough of the hard sciences that I liked. So then I moved on to human bio and then I realized that human bio doesn't have much of the humanistic approaches um, uh, like um, uh, sociology and public health and things of that sort that, are, that I really found um, that I was really passionate about. So then I um, found the degree known as public uh, or it's health promotion and disease prevention studies, which is a fancy word for public health. And I fell in love with two important concepts that I encountered. The first being health disparities. Um, health disparities for those um, who don't know are the preventable differences in health outcomes that disproportionately affect underserved communities. So it wasn't until when I went to USC and I learned about health disparities that I was that I reflected and, and realized like, wow, there are so many uh, people in my community are so disadvantaged um, in, in terms of uh, their, their health. And, and then I also encountered another important concept known as the social determinants of health. And those are the non-biological factors that have an, um, an impact on human health and function. And again, it wasn't until I learned about this at USC when I realized, wow, like I grew up very impoverished. I grew up in a place where there's a, um, an exorbitant degree of an intergenerational poverty. So um, when they say that you go to college and you end up having your, your horizons broaden or you have those aha moments, that's why I ended up uh, falling in love with, with public health because it really, again, made me realize just how um, uh, disadvantaged my community was and how important it was for me to go back and be able to address those um, concerns. Still want to talk about USC for me, my uh, being first generation, that experience of being uh, in Los Angeles and being pre-med uh, at a, a prestigious university like USC was very difficult. Um, it, you know, and I, and I say that because there were a ton of novel experiences and by novel, I mean, everything that I, I went through was pretty much new. Um, the first time that I ever held a micro pipette was in my general chemistry lab. And the first time that I ever looked through the lens of a microscope was in general biology. So you can only imagine with those novel types of novel experiences, how difficult it was for me to understand um, the concepts in, in that I was uh, learning and actually struggled with. But um, I'm, I am where I am today. So I just wanna, uh, before I move on to the next picture, just wanna provide some hope um, and let you know that even in the darkest days, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, moving on to the next picture on the left, you see the box of oranges that uh, represents the halos. Um, so I, after I graduated from USC, I moved back to the Central Valley uh, and I found a, a job as um, a health coach. So I worked for the wonderful company. For those who don't know, they um, are a consumer goods organization that produces uh, agricultural products like uh, palm water, Fiji, um, Fiji, uh, 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 Fiji water, palm juice, uh, they have pistachio and almonds, and again, I worked at the Halos plant. They also have their hands dipped in different types of sectors. Um, they also founded my high school with a wonderful college prep academy, and they also had clinics at the industrial plants where a lot of their uh, workers were um, immigrant farm laborers. So um, I felt like it was like a mini circle moment for me to come back. Um, although I wasn't in the role of a physician, I was in the role of a health coach. Um, so. A little bit more about the clinics that I worked at. So um, the clinics were situated within the plants and these uh, employees don't have to punch out or they don't have to use uh, their PTO to um, come and visit the clinic. They actually, they actually got paid to come see us when they got sick. Um, everything at the clinics was free. So if anything that we prescribed, any type of like um, uh, radiology order uh, or referral, like we would pay for, which is great considering the demographic that we were working with, um, given that a lot of these um, families are socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. So um, for me, I, in terms of what I did as a health coach, it's kind of a, it, the term can be, it, it changes in different settings, or at least the meaning does. But I think the best way to explain it to you is by, letting you know or describing to you what my work week looked like. So Mondays and Tuesdays, I would be with the endocrinologist and I would be in the role of a medical assistant. The patients would come in, I'd take their vital signs, uh, which is their temperature, blood pressure, their weight, all that good stuff. I report to the physician, let them know what the patient is here for. And I'm in the room documenting everything that happens um, in, in the, um, during that visit. 
as the patient leaves, I walk them to the front desk and I schedule them for appointments with myself. So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is when I am um, acting in the role of a health coach and I'm a mentor, an ally, and most importantly, I'm an educator. Um, it's here where I had the opportunity to work among an interdisciplinary team of medical professionals, but it was great to be able to impact these patients' health without even learning how to use a stethoscope or knowing how to prescribe medications. Um, Fast forwarding to the um, now, so I, I was actually at Wonderful um, working as a health coach for about three and a half years. And um, this past um, um, month, I actually um, completed my uh, summer uh, program. It was an early matriculation program. So I ultimately applied to about 33 schools, which we'll talk about later. Um, and I actually applied at a time when the COVID pandemic was in full swing. So my experience was a bit of an anomaly and it's um, hopefully not gonna be like that for those who are applying in this cycle or in the next. Um, I hope things are much smoother for you all, but um, I ultimately decided on Stanford. And um, so, so I was accepted to Stanford Medicine and then I applied for an early start program called the Leadership and Health Disparities. And you can only imagine, you know, after this introduction that I've given myself, why is it that I would like to start medical school early instead of vacationing on a beach somewhere? But again, it's because health disparities um, and those inequities that many of these people face and many of your family members face are very important to me. And I feel like being, yes, you know, being, uh, yes, we are, for, uh, but yes, being a first generation student, we are disadvantaged, but we are going to be the people that are on the front lines that are, have the capability, the tools, the resources to come back and address these uh, disparities and inequities, um, not just in our own communities, but in others. Um, so this program, I, uh, it's a research-based initiative and I get paired with a mentor who's a physician and I perform research. I took courses in clinical skills, professionalism and medicine. I took a crash course in anatomy. Um, I actually start school on August 24th, which is in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, well, we're here to talk about the application process and also to provide insight on my successes and also the pitfalls that I had um, in, in hopes that you know you all can achieve the, your dream of becoming a physician. Um, I know that was quite a lengthy introduction to myself, but I wanted to make this whole presentation as personable as possible. We're gonna I'm gonna be showing you all um, my ac my actual um, medical school application. Um, but with that, I think without giving you this introduction or this context, it might be a little difficult for you to get the most out of this presentation. But if any of you have any questions about my experiences at USC, about working at Wonderful, uh, or obviously applying to medical school, which is what we're here for today, please um, feel free to reach out. We have a Q&A session at the end, as Gedan mentioned, um, and you can just drop your questions in the chat as we go, but we won't answer them to the end. But next slide. So. I like to think of the application in four distinct phases. We have the primary application, which we're going to be talking about today. Then we have secondaries, then interviews, and then the ultimate waiting game, which is the admissions decision. So starting with the primary application, this is what we're going to be reviewing. We're going to be, I'm going to be showing you uh, the um, snapshots on my application that show you my biographic information, my grades, my MCAT, my letters of rec, uh, not the actual letters, but um, exactly what that looks like on the application. So it's important for you to uh, know that all schools receive the same primary application. So you're gonna be uh, uploading all information onto a specific website, which I'll show you um, um, in a couple minutes. Um, but when you get to the next phase, so once, once you schools receive, say you apply to 20 schools and uh, those 20 schools like what they see, uh, then you get 20, uh, then you get 20 other secondary applications and those are all different. Those they ask, every school will ask different questions. Some have personality questionnaires, um, some have different essays. Um, so it can be a very um, overwhelming process if you're not prepared. And that's gonna be one of the key themes in this presentation to not only obviously apply to medical school, but to put you in the best position to, um, to apply. So say, you know, you, applied, you you submitted those 20 secondaries and now you have 20 interviews. Now you also have to consider like where, uh, uh, well, obviously you're gonna be excited, but you also have to consider what that cost is gonna be like. So at, towards the end of this application, we're also gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be sharing with you what it, how, what, how much it costs to actually apply. Um, and then lastly, if after your interviews, it takes about three months for you to hear back from uh, any of the schools so that, uh, you end the season with, you know, getting admitted and, then, you know, making the right moves to change your life around and start medical school. Next slide, please. So uh, you will be applying to medical school using AMCAS. AMCAS is um, 
an abbreviation for the American Medical College Application Service. Hopefully some of you have already heard about this. If not, uh, don't worry, that's what, we're, that's what I'm here for today. So the AMCAS is uh, it's a centralized platform that collects all of your personal data that is then uh, sent to the schools that you designate. Um, AMCAS has three executive functions. The first is um, it provides the um, application submission platform. Um, here you submit one primary application as mentioned before. You obtain all of the transcripts from schools that you went to. So I know I told you that I graduated from USC, but I also did a post -bac program. Um, and I did that at um, a, a DIY or do it yourself. So um, I did it at different campuses. So I needed to get transcripts from all those schools as well. Um, even, you know, if you for were for some reason went to a technical school, like uh, maybe you also went to a phlebotomy school and you got a grade um, and it wasn't like at a like at a university, but you got a transcript, you need to also include that on MCAS as well. And then also you need to you're going to have to manually enter all of your grades, all the pluses, the minuses, the units, um, and um, that's going to be for the purpose of calculating your GPAs. The second executive function that AMCAS performs is processing all this information. So they perform a verification check. They um, also review the National Clearinghouse database to ensure that you um, actually graduated from the schools that you say you did. And uh, that's when uh, they also calculated, calculated GPA, which is very important. Um, the third function is that they deliver your primary application um, to the schools on your list. And they also uh, deliver the letters of rec. Uh, so that's up that slide. Moving forward, there's a, an important concept that I want to share with you all. Um, it's rolling at admissions. And when I initially applied, it wasn't something that I was entirely aware of. Um, so the scenario is, uh, you see this picture, it's um, people playing musical chairs. Um, so um, I, I promise you that this, as this explanation goes forward, you'll understand a little bit more about why I use this metaphor and how you can best leverage this knowledge uh, to gain access to interview seats at an earlier rate than other applicants and why that is very important. Um, so imagine that you, along with the thousand of other applicants to medical school, are playing a game of musical chairs, and each seat represents an interview invitation. So while the music is playing, applicants walk around the chairs, but when the music is turned off, only the first person to sit down on the chair gets an interview. Uh, they take their chair with them, and another applicant enters the game. However, there is one less, ch uh, one less chair to compete for. So in summary, uh, if that metaphor explanation wasn't the greatest, um, the premise of rolling admissions is founded in the idea that the sooner in which you apply or submit your application, the sooner you can have a chance at receiving um, an interview offer of which there is a finite number of. Um, there is actually a study through the Texas Medical School application, which is separate from the one that we're talking about today, in which uh, they released data showing that students that applied early uh, had a higher uh, rate of, of getting interviews, but also uh, getting admitted to medical school. Now, AMCAS, the American Medical College Application Service, uh, does not, uh, has, they have access to that data, but they don't release it. AMCAS is a governing body, as mentioned, that uh, actually uh, makes money. So they make money off of people who use their service. So if, as you could think that it's a business model, if you're uh, you don't want people you're trying to maximize your profits and if you start revealing the inner workings of your model then you don't make as much money so um if there's anything to take away from this slide it's that uh, we want you to apply early and it's something that i heard all throughout even before applying so uh, that's going to be one of the key takeaways on this one here we have a snapshot of the applica application timeline we have something uh, or something i like to regard as what is optimal and suboptimal uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of overlap throughout each stage. So the blue is what is optimal. This is a time. It, this is the best time in which you should take your MCAT, submit your primaries, um, submit your secondary, schedule interviews, and then you have the gray, which is suboptimal, uh, in which you uh, may still submit all the materials. But if we refer back to the musical chairs uh, concept or metaphor, it's important that you submit in the blue area um, as much as possible. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you submit at a time in the gray areas, you're not going to get in. But again, we uh, want to put ourselves in the best position forward and, and, set, you, uh, and be, set yourself up for success. Here we have the um, deadlines or important dates for, from AMCAS. Um, so these deadlines are from this year. So if you're, uh, for people that are currently submitting an application now, they, um, AMCAS hasn't released the deadlines for next year. Um, and it, there's something important that uh, I want you to note um, that you people are applying now, but they won't start. So now we're in August. 
um, but they won't start medical school until a year from now. So the application cycle is the whole year. Therefore, the timing, um, you know, it might seem like it's a lot of time, but in reality, uh, the timing is critical. So uh, there are a couple uh, dates for that I want you to keep, be aware of. So the AMCAS application, the primary application opened uh, May 4th, and you can actually start pre-filling all of your biographical information, your grades, um, start inputting like who's, who's gonna write your letters of rec. Um, and you, can, you could have done that as early as May 4th. The first day that you can hit submit is May 31st. Um, and actually after that, there's um, a 24 day grace period in which applications are being verified and held. Um, and the last on the bottom is when all those verified applications are sent to the medical schools of your choice. So the MCAS application sections of my application that I'm going to be sharing with you all, there's actually six of them. Um, and again, it, it's something uh, that I want to kind of personalize for you all. The first is um, the identifiable and biographic information. Uh, the next section is going to, uh, we're going to review the schools that I attended and also a snapshot of the grades that I got. Uh, the next is the work and activities section, which is my favorite. If anyone is crazy enough to say that they have a, a favorite section on, on this application, uh, like myself. Uh, the next is the letters of, of rec or letters of evaluation and the list of medical schools that I applied to. And uh, the next is the essays. We're gonna be, um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of my personal statement, uh, talk about uh, the disadvantage and institutional action statements as well. And lastly, um, it's a standardized test, but um, I want it to include uh, a metric. So that's GPA, uh, GPA and MCAT as well. All right, so this is what my uh, application looked like. The, um, so upon downloading the completed PDF version of your application, we encountered this first section. The black boxes um, is the information that I've redacted um, just because it's my personal information, like my home address and my, my email and such, uh, which by, by the way, if anyone wants my email and um, you can, I'll put it, I'll type it into the uh, chat during the, the Q&A section. Um, I, there's two things that I want to note at the top, the first yellow box where it says submission date. So you'll see that I submitted my application June 1st um, and the box to the right where it says process, processed, that says July 12th. So that's about 1.5 months after I hit submit. As I uh, also want to remind you that I applied during the height of the COVID pandemic. So it, um, the application cycle was, uh, pushed, uh, was pushed back. So there was a lot of, um, of things that were unknown at the time. So a lot of people were stressing like myself as to when should I apply and what is most optimal. But uh, as mentioned before, the earlier that you apply, the better. Um, so I actually, even when, even though they pushed it back, I still applied about a week and a half or two weeks after we were allowed to hit submit. And that took me, that took a one, uh, that took 1.5 months uh, uh, longer for me to, uh, before I got verified. I want to share, let you know that I have a, men, uh, a mentor who is a second year medical student at UCLA who um, stayed up until midnight on the first day and hit submit. And then she went to sleep. By the time she woke up about seven hours later, she was already verified. So in her case, it was eight hours. In mine, it was 1.5 months, which in the grand scheme of things, in my case, it wasn't you know, terrible. It wasn't that deleterious because I applied sort of in the four on uh, the former half of the application cycle. But when you're considering 1.5 months and you're, you know, 1.5 months beginning when you uh, submit in August or September, like it's no longer going to be one and a half. It might be two months or maybe even longer. So again, that's why timing is important. Um, and again, this is where I'd like to just introduce the idea, the idea of what is optimal and, and what, is, what is suboptimal. The next is the list of schools uh, that I attended. Um, so as mentioned, I went to USC. Uh, the other schools uh, I enrolled in um, as a, um, a do DIY, do-it-yourself post -back program, which is not something that many people do. So if uh, I hope someone asks questions about this experience. I believe it was uh, necessary in order for me to kind of uh, demonstrate the um, academic potential and academic capability by taking courses um, in a post -back, which for those who don't know, uh, that is any course that is taken after you received your bachelor's degree. Um, there's actually one school on here that's not listed. It's Bakers for College, but I went to three to about six schools. So I had to actually get six transcripts uh, from all of these institutions, not only once for the initial primary ap ap application, but once you, you know, when all of you get accepted to the medical school of your dreams, you have to then go back to all these schools and send them directly to the school that you are um, uh, matriculating at. 
So this, uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this slide and what you're seeing here is an incomplete list of the courses that I've taken. As mentioned before, you know, I, I said that, you know, USC was a struggle for me academically, uh, but um, I actually sent, uh, you're looking at probably the best sheet of uh, the best representation of what my grades were at USC, but I can promise you they were not all A's. You do see a C on there, but I also talked to you about that as well. Um, so when you start inputting all this information into your uh, um, into the AMCAST primary app, you'll have to, again, obtain your, your transcripts. Um, and I want to introduce the document on the right. So this is a course classification document that you're going to be using. So um, you'll, you're going to have to designate which, which of your classes are biology, uh, which of those are, you know, communications, business, fine arts. You know, obviously, this depends on your major. Um, so there's something important on the on the document on the right, there's an orange box that, that circles BCPM. That's biology, biology, chemistry, physics, or math. So this is a separate, this is AMCAS's designation of, of the STEM courses. Um, in order for a class to be BPCM, it needs to be 51% science-based, but that is up to your own discretion. So for example, there's a course, um, BISC 321, that was taught in the biology department, but I still had to go back and manually classify that as biology. Um, and I'll tell you why that um, that's important. So um, upon entering all these uh, all this information, you're going to have to, uh, you'll, you'll be given a different GPAs, which we'll show you, uh, which we'll show you in, in the next couple of slides, but I still wanna take some more time and dive into what we're actually looking at here. Um, one course specifically is GERO 440. GERO stands for gerontology, and the class was biodemography of aging. So this course was not taught in the biology department, but I classified it myself as biology. Uh, however, up here, uh, or the document on the right, I believe it falls under the public health uh, uh, courses, but that's why it's, uh, this is an opportunity for you to kind of boost your science GPA, or you, this is an, uh, an area in which you have a sense of autonomy. Um, and for my case, it, because I, my science GPA wasn't the greatest, um, I wanted to um, uh, you know, increase it as much as possible. So I designated this course as biology because of the name in and of itself, it's the prefix is bio. Um, and the, obviously I looked at the syllabus and I truly thought that this course had a lot of um, hard science in it as well. Uh, the next example is HP442. Um, that's chronic disease epidemiology. So it's uh, taught in my major department, health promotion. Um, and on the list, on the document on the right, that's public health. But I classified it as math. And because of that, um, it went through without any type of uh, rejection from the reviewer. They said, okay, we agree with you. It was actually incorporated into my science GPA, which is great because I got an A um, and it was worth four units. And uh, I will say that that one was kind of a stretch for the classification purposes. And I will also include that just because this epidemiology course was approved for math on my end, it doesn't mean that your epidemiology course from U from UCLA or from Cal State Northridge or wherever, from wherever you're, you're coming from, doesn't mean that if you classify this, your epidemiology course as math, it will also be uh, included into BPCM. It's on a case by case basis. Um, the next course is um, at the bottom, it's Psych 321. That's Intro to Behavioral Neuroscience. It's taught in the psychology department, but because uh, neuroscience incorporates the uh, concepts from biology and psych, um, I actually designated it as biology, and it was also included into my science GPA, and also great because I got an A. Um, so what happens in the event where you, you know, you designate a course as a science, uh, but your verifier says no, that it's not? So you get a, a rejection and you have the opportunity to appeal. And there's three things that you have to do in order to uh, get this course to count. Um, and and it sounds like extra work, but you really have to fight for every single point when it comes to um, uh, getting that, that final GPA calculation, just because you're competing with many different talented uh, individuals. So you need to put yourself in the best situation and present yourself uh, in, in all the hard work that, that you put in. Um, so in order, if, if it gets rejected, you need to do three things. The first is you need to copy and paste the course description, um, and that's found usually on your school's website. If you can't find it, go ahead and email the department head in which that course is taught in. You also need to request uh, uh, or upload the course syllabus, um, and you also have to write out why, you know, your reason for the appeal. Um, so there's a couple uh, pro tips that I want to share with you. The first is, so say, for example, for questionable courses, 
um, like say for example, like for chronic disease epidemiology, I didn't really, you know, it was kind of a shot in the dark, like maybe I get counted into my science GPA, maybe not. So in the event that it didn't, um, I was already prepared to send that appeal right back. Um, and uh, so I actually emailed my professor um, and keep in mind that I took this course like three years before I applied. So she actually didn't even work at USC anymore. And it took me about three weeks to get a copy of the syllabus from the department head. Um, so again, those three weeks can, do take up a lot of time and you only have a limited time frame in which you have the chance to appeal before your whole application gets rejected and you have to resubmit. Um, the second pro tip that I have is, you know, say for example, that I received a terrible grade in my uh, neuroscience course and which is here at the bottom and you know say I got like a C which again it's not not I don't want to say that C's are bad because I had uh, multiple C's but say in this case um, if I didn't want it to count to my science GPA which is actually a smart move I w instead of classifying it as biology I would just classify it as it's on here somewhere it's BESS here we go behavioral and social sciences um, maybe neuroscience neuroscience course isn't the best example of that, but I think that would have been more plausible for something like epidemiology, which is taught in the public health school, I would have designated it as, as public health. Um, if I got a bad grade, because I didn't, I designated it as math. So that's just um, an example. Um, and the third pro tip, I want to highlight the grade that I got, the lackluster grade that I got in physics at USC. Um, specifically, I want you to point your attention to this X right here. So any, anywhere you see an X, um, in this slide it's only one, that means that the reviewer went back and realized that I made an error in, uh, in transcribing either the name of the course, the, uh, the number, um, and uh, basically the way that it was written on my official transcript, it, that's not the way that it looked like on this application, and because of that, it was counted as a correction. So you only get seven corrections before your application is rejected and your everything needs to be resubmitted again. So you need to double, triple and quadruple check all of this information uh, to ensure that you, uh, you know, don't get sent back to the bottom of the pile. That's it for that side. And again, now uh, the section, the, uh, the favorite section that I have, it's the work and activities. And so there's more than one way to write about your experiences. Um, I prefer integrating stories and anecdotes, and if you're anything, uh, anyone like me who watches a lot of YouTube, you might have stumbled across Dr. Gray's YouTube uh, channel who expounds upon the importance of uh, showing and not telling and using your, your life experiences to kind of detail what it is that you went through and how uh, you've been impacted. Um, so you get 15 slots or 15 uh, spaces to write about uh, these different activities. I prefer quality over quantity, although I did have 13 entries on my work and activity section, but keep in mind that uh, I applied when I was 26 years old. I was about what, my third or fourth gap year. And um, so I had extra time to engage in new activities. So I had more activities and experiences to share, but don't think that you have to hit 15 um, just because you know you do want to preserve the quality of your work and remember that a lot of the you know the people who are reviewing your essays are human and if you're just trying to hit the maximum number of of entries and you are sacrificing that quality it's going to get a little um, a little daunting and a little tedious for them and dry as well so you get 700 characters to write about these um, experiences and if you're anyone like me um, who likes to talk a lot, but also write a lot. Uh, 700 characters is not enough, so you have to be very strategic. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, reading through my these two ex uh, examples right now. But um, one, one important thing to note is that you can. You sh it is very. It is highly recommended that you only include experiences that you started right after graduating from um, high school. The caveat to this is you can include activities that you started in high school, but continued throughout college and beyond. One of those for me was picking grapes or working as a farm laborer. I did that in high school, during college, and even right after um, the summer right after that I graduated. So I was able to um, include all of those hours, uh, which really you know, um, shows um, the continuity of my work and my dedication to an activity that is, has been, uh, that was most memorable for me. Um, and by most memorable, it's actually called uh, most memorable experience or MEE. -E. So you can designate three of your activities as most memorable. And what that means is you get the 700 characters, like the rest 
of the examples, but if it's most memorable, you get an additional 1,325 characters, uh, which is more than double of what is, uh, uh, or it's actually triple of the initial amount. Uh, so um, I, the, we're gonna now go through the two entries that I have here. The first is uh, the one at the, uh, at the top, um, and it's a shadowing opportunity. So um, up to this point, I hope we all know what a shadow is. Um, for those that don't, it, you basically just, uh, uh, follow a physician. You're basically like a fly in the wall when you're in the room with the patient just observing. And um, I want you to try and think about what can be said about me as a person through my writing. Um, and uh, so before, but before I do that, I just want to show you, you do have to get the contact name and the, uh, of the person that you, that you're, who's in charge of the experience of this activity. For, in this case, it was Dr. Juan Bautista. You needed, I needed his email address, his phone, and I also needed to keep track of how many hours that I, uh, I um, invested in this activity. So um, it's kind of an honor system. I You have to guesstimate how many hours that you dedicate to each activity. There's no actual way in which they could go back and confirm whether or not you did, whether or not I did 420 hours other than calling or emailing Dr. Bautista and asking him um, for that number, but he most likely won't remember that, know that actual figure as well. Uh, but definitely this is not something that you want to over, um, uh, uh, over inflate, just be um, honest. Um, and it'll be sh uh, shown in your writing as well. So we'll go through the first one. And I wrote, um, the majority of the 30,000 annual office visits at Bautista Medical Group tend to rural and underserved communities across the San Joaquin Valley. Here, Dr. Bautista provides exceptional medical care to many farm workers and undocumented migrants with or without health insurance and often accepts his payment whatever his patients can offer. I observed Dr. Bautista treat varicose veins with endovenous laser therapy, remove ingrown toenails, and manage conditions like diabetes and hypertension. I followed a clinician who heals before thinking of receiving anything in return, who supported me financially with numerous scholarships, and who sparked my interest in primary care. So there's something that I, I really want to emphasize here, and I think that I, uh, not to toot my own horn, but I really think that I hit it home with uh, the, the sentence where it says, I found a clinician who heals before thinking of receiving anything in return. And this shows um, that I value uh, his traits as, as a, um, the traits that he ex exudes as a person. It shows that, uh, that I'm inspired by primary care. Through this uh, writing, I showed that I've demonstrated experience with working, working with medically underserved and vulnerable populations. And I also sprinkled in with only one sentence, uh, I think it's about 300 characters, what it is that I did as a shadow. Um, keep in mind that I, you are not going to be the only person, or in my case, I was not the only person that shadowed. Um, the idea here is to try to uh, try to strategize your writing in a way that dis uh, distinguishes me from the thousands of other students that also shadowed um, um, in, in their own respective uh, regions. The second example is uh, a tutor, and. I hope we all know what a tutor is, so I'm not going to go up forth and explain. But again, I had to collect all the basic information about who was in charge, um, the contact name and the hours. Neither of these experiences were most memorable for me. So uh, again, I was only allotted only 700, uh, 700 characters. And with that amount, I wrote on the bottom, I'll read it to you. It's, At an early age, I knew that I wanted to become a physician. However, the education system that I was raised in lacked appropriate funding, access to STEM programs, and relevant mentorship to guide my career goals. As a college prep tutor, I sought to mentor students who were interested in pursuing a career in healthcare, a form of support that I wish I had access to while growing up. Aside from offering homework help, I provided a space for young scholars to discuss career pathways available to them. This experience reminded me of my community's need for youth peer mentoring and solidified my desire to return to my community and address these disparities. So I literally only used five words to describe what I did as a tutor, and that is aside from offering homework help. Um, so the rest of the characters were dedicated to talking about the academic environment that I grew up in. And I mentioned that I wanted to return to my community and be an agent of change, um, and I showed impact, uh, and I showed how you know the lack of tutoring and mentorship in my community impacted me, and how I wanted to uh, address that by offering uh, you know more than just homework help. Um, again, the idea with the work and activities, uh, and and this for these two experiences for those that are very basic and are general. Um, 
you really want to be able to use anecdotes and stories uh, to kind of distinguish you from the rest of of the people who shadow and uh, who um, who are interns, um, you know, who are COVID screeners, like that's going to be a big one for when you guys apply. So if any of you are COVID screeners, try to include a story uh, or something that you saw that will separate you from the thousands of other applicants who were uh, asking people uh, or checking their temperatures and, you know, asking them, you know, what their symptoms were and if they had any. That's that for that slide. Now we're going to be shifting our attention to the letters of evaluation. So you are allowed a maximum of 10 letters of rec. Uh, you don't have to have 10. I did. Uh, again, keep in mind that uh, I was an older applicant, so I was I had other experiences uh, um, and other people that I wanted to incorporate in, in my journey uh, and to be presented alongside my application. But I honestly, I would say don't freak out if you don't have 10. I'm, in all honesty, like four or five would be fine, um, but they need to be four or five really good letters. And the reason why there's such a significant spread is because the schools determine how many letters of rec that you need. Um, so the top picture you'll have all these, these are all the uh, individuals in which I requested a letter of rec and their, their, uh, their affiliation, um, like what, what do they work at? Um, and then the number of schools in which I send each letter. So the first letter uh, belonged to Dr. Rita Burke, who was my PI or the primary investigator of a research study that I worked on, because uh, I've actually still working in that study now to this day. She's been very integral to uh, my story and she knows a lot about me. So I figured, you know, the letter that she write is going to be you know, of high quality. So I sent that to all 33 schools that I applied to. But then if you look down um, the third entry from the bottom, Dr. Juan Bautista's letter, um, I only sent it that to one school. And I'll tell you uh, why, uh, why I, uh, I did that. Not because I didn't think his letter was gonna be great, but it's because you need to strategize uh, the, the letters in which you send. Um, like for example, um, you, uh, the U, uh, UCLA Charles Drew, um, so on the bottom actually, let me uh, um, take a couple steps back. I, this is a screenshot, the bottom picture of an Excel sheet that I created. Uh, you have the schools on the left and then you have like where the school's located, the metrics like MCAT, GPA, that stuff's not relevant to what we're talking about now. What I want you to look at is where this outline is in red. Um, that's, uh, so I copy, I went to the school, each school's website and I copied the text um, that talks about their letter of rec um, uh, requirements. So for the, uh, the first row, we have UC Riverside. They want a minimum of three letters and a maximum of five. Um, and uh, they tell you for UC Riverside, they say these letters may be written by a pre-medical advisor, an undergraduate uh, uh, professor, a mentor, or any individual of your choice, which is great. Uh, other schools are, will be very stringent. They will tell you, you need to have them from these letters. Two of them need to be from a science professor and one of them needs to be from a non-science professor. Um, and then in terms of strategizing, like for example, like I applied to um, Stanford, obviously, because I'm here now, but uh, my, boss at the wonderful where I worked, he was a Stanford graduate. So I made sure to ask a letter for him. Um, I would have done it anyways, even if I didn't apply to Stanford uh, because I'd been there working alongside him for so long. Um, but that's what I mean when I talk about strategy. Um, if you have any connection to any school through people in your network, use it, leverage it because it's only going to help you. Um, and then, yeah, so that's on that slide with letters of evaluation. The next uh, slide that we have here, it's uh, dedicating it to a service that's called Interfolio. It's a centralized web service that uh, collects all of your letters of rec from your letter writers. Um, so basically, uh, you pay for this subscription service. It's $48. Unfortunately, you do have to pay for this, but I'll try to convince you as much as I can to uh, go forward with it because it was very useful um, it, for, for me when I was applying. Um, so one of the benefits is uh, in and I'll preface by saying that medical schools expect for you to not have seen these letters of rec. You, know, you actually sign uh, electronically stating that you haven't uh, seen these letters of rec. And if for whatever reason they find out that you have and you lied, it can be very detrimental to your application. Um, and Interfolio, um, it's like a third party. So you you can you set up like a, like a request through the website and there's uh, someone on the back end that is communicating um, with the letter of rec writer. They send them um, courtesy emails. So their emails, you know, they're not coming from you directly. They're actually, you know, coming from a third person. So if, if you're worried about like, uh, you know, being, for lack of a better word, like annoying to the person that you're uh, asking for, it's not necessarily coming from you and it's automatic as well. As the date gets closer to um, the, the letter of rec uh, requirement, um, 
which you can actually set on your own, the, gen the, the emails are automatically generated. Um, you can actually request letters for free, but you can't send them until you pay for the web service. Um, but in and of itself, in the end, I highly recommend that you use Interfolio. So now we're going to be talking about metrics. And by that, I mean MCAT and GPA. As a disclaimer, for privacy reasons, I decided not to include my GPA and MCAT. But for those that are logging into the presentation and have questions about that, that information specifically, I'd be happy to talk to you about them uh, during Q&A. So um, again, these pictures were taken from the internet. At the top, this is what is on your application uh, when you download it, obviously, and what is de delivered to the schools. So this person took the MCAT twice. The first one is the bottom entry at 493, which is the 24th percentile. Uh, we won't get into the specifics about you know what's a good MCAT score or not, but uh, he took it, the that person took it twice and they got a 512 the second time. There's not much more to the MCAT portion, but um, as we'll shift our attention to the bottom picture, that's the GPA, uh, the GPA breakdowns that are very important. I mean, actually tends to be a little bit more complex. Um, and remember, this, this is all, all this information that you see in the bottom uh, refers to you uploading all your uh, course grades um, and the slide, a couple slides back that I was mentioning. So pointing our attention to the first yellow uh, la, um, box that you see here, it encircles the high school portion. So for me, I took about I want to say 32 college credits as a high school. That was one of the benefits of going to my uh, the wonderful college prep academies that they gave us an opportunity for dual enrollment courses. So I had about 32 units. Um, and so that GPA was, they, they, medical schools do look at these uh, the grades that I got in high school, but only those in which were taken for college credit. Uh, many of you who, um, you know, the majority of people don't take dual enrollment courses. So yours won't have, uh, it won't have your high school grades on it unless you took college courses. You also then have your freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year uh, grades as well. And I want to point to uh, looking at freshman through junior year, um, there's an upward trend. First, uh, you know, this person started off with a 3.16, didn't do much better his sophomore year, uh, um, and got a 3.17. And then junior year, although it was only eight credits of science course and eight credits of, uh, or just eight credits in total, um, that is a 4.0. I would say that if this person took more credits during their junior year and, all, and still got a 4.0, that is what we call a great upward trend. And I will say that when I applied to uh, medical school, uh, my GPA uh, had a really, uh, really sharp and really distinct upward trend. Um, so even if it starts, you start off, you know, your college career, and I don't want you to linger too much in the past uh, if you had, you know, lackluster grades, as long as you can show academic improvement um, through, you know, your uh, the latter half of your undergraduate career, or if you enroll in a post back program like I did, and you, that's where your opportunity for you to show academic capability and academic potential. The second box on the, uh, the second box on the bottom, it's, uh, that's where the post back grades go. Um, and uh, that's pretty much, uh, I actually just wanted to say that this GPA is going to be distinct from the other. So again, post back or any course that you took after uh, obtaining your, your college degree. Um, and in my case, which uh, was very important in terms of applying to medical school. Uh, but that's that on the GPA and MCAT. I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> the designated program. So again, this is an incomplete list of the schools that I applied to just because again, I applied to about 33. And, um, and again, one of the most important aspects of applying to medical school and where a lot of students fall short <clears throat> is they don't know um, which schools to apply to. So, um, and we're, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about how, you know, what does that mean? How do I know which schools apply to? Like my dream school is is Harvard. Why did, wouldn't I apply to Harvard? But you have to, uh, there's certain uh, things that you need to consider, like uh, whether you fit, um, you know, the, the not only the, de the demographic profile, but what, the, what Harvard is looking for in an applicant. That's something that you can find um, on something that is called the MSAR. I've linked it in the, down at the bottom, and I'm sure the Central Valley Scholars team will also provide you with all these links that, that, um, uh, that I've been referring to. Uh, but the MSAR is the Medical School Admissions Requirements Database. You have to pay for it. It's about $36, if I'm not mistaken, um, and it, can, it contains pretty much everything that you need to know about the 154 uh, MD medical schools in the United States. Um, here is where they will display, you can click, you know, search 
Stanford and it'll, uh, it'll, it'll show their page, all the contact information, the different programs that they have. It'll show the mission and the vision statements, which are super important um, for you to try and decide if you'll, you know, if you'll even fit or if you'll, you think you'll fit in at a place uh, um, like this or, or any school that you're interested in. Um, it's also important, like, for example, if a school states that they they're all about social justice, like UCLA, Charles Drew, um, if you're someone that hasn't demonstrated a commitment to social justice, then I would not spend the money and throw it away uh, um, by uh, um, applying to UCLA Charles Drew. That's why it's important that you review these mission and vision statements, because otherwise your all this money is going to AMCAS. It's not even going to the school in and of itself. So that's just something for you to uh, be aware of. Again, also, you it's important um, that you review the GPA and metrics. Um, on through the MSAR or the database that I'm talking about, but I will say that you know do not use GPA and and MCAT score as sole guidance for creating your school list. Definitely, as mentioned before, check out the mission and the vision statements to see if you fit. Um, and I really want to stress this um, that I want that you should you should apply to your dream school even if your GPA and metrics are below um, the uh, the 25th to 50th percentile. Um, I know that someone was admitted to an Ivy League school with an MCAT around the 50th percentile. So, um, and even myself, uh, for a lot of the schools that I applied to, I wasn't necessarily uh, at the top or um, definitely not even within the top 10 percentile. So um, definitely I want to give you as much um, animo and as much um, hope, uh, but also again, you need to be realistic and not apply to all the Ivy Leagues if you have a you know, not so great MCAT score and a not so great GPA. Um, so I wanted to take this time and actually go through the couple, uh, highlight a couple schools. So the ones in red, uh, in retrospect, I would not have applied to. The first one, or well, if we're, I, I would not recommend that you apply to if, if you fit these general criteria. So starting with the first one, it's the Krikorian School of UNLV. I actually was admitted to this school, but um, it's I will say that I applied to it because I lived in Vegas for two years and I had uh, family members that uh, actually still live there. So I emailed the school and I asked them, hey, like I, I used to live there, I have family, like is that enough of a, a close tie? Uh, and they said yes, and it ended up you know, working out for me. Um, although that state, that school was, they gave me no financial aid, it was very expensive. I would have to pay uh, like 100% of everything, but um, so unless you have ties to Vegas, don't go there. Uh, the next one is the Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine. So Oregon only has one me one MD medical school, uh, doctorate of medicine, and one doctor of osteopathic medicine uh, in the entire state. So uh, Oregon, at least for the MD program, only uh, they they favor in-state students, but they also state on their website that they. Um, uh, accept students from neighboring states. So I thought, oh, okay, like, sure, I live in California. Let me apply to Oregon Health and Sciences. And it was dead silence. I didn't receive much. So I would just uh, say, tread carefully if you think, you know, just because you're from California, you should apply to this school. If you, you know, maybe you spent a summer in Oregon or you have an aunt that lives there, contact the school, reach out to them and ask if that's enough. Um, and you'll, uh, you'll be surprised as to what you hear back uh, from the schools. The next one is uh, UCLA Charles Drew. That one is actually one of my most uh, favorite programs um, in the entire country. Um, I actually uh, got an interview there, but didn't unfortunately make it past uh, that, that round. It's actually a very, very small program with a cohort of 24 students. Um, and I'll just talk about it a little bit. And it offers a unique MD experience and that it focuses on health equity and social justice. So basically you are a UCLA medical student, you pay tuition to UCLA, you take your, your first and your second years are on the Westwood main campus, but your third and your fourth year, which are known as your clerkships, when you rotate amongst the different specialties, uh, those are done in South Central LA at the Martin Luther King Hospital, which was actually 10 minutes away from USC where I went to undergrad. So I thought it would be a great way for me to stay in a neighborhood that uh, reminded me a lot of my own, given that it's medically underserved, uh, very impoverished. Uh, but um, I just wanted to also highlight that, uh, definitely highlight that school. The next we have uh, the uh, the other UCs like Davis and UCSF. So UC Davis has, um, all of them have an incredible prime program. The prime program is meant to help address the shortage of uh, physicians in the Central Valley. So for example, Davis favors students from the Central Valley and Northern California. Um, UCSF has a specific SJV prime program, San Joaquin Valley. Um, so if you live in the Central Valley, I would 100% apply to UCSF. 
um, UC Riverside is, is very um, not so friendly even to its in-state students. You actually, they have a very high preference for students that come from the Inland Empire, which is where the Riverside um, is located. So if you're not from the Inland, um, the Inland Empire, um, and if you don't necessarily fit their mission, then I wouldn't apply to UC Riverside. Um, and the bottom one uh, is U um, University of Illinois, which has a high um, acceptance rate for out-of-state students. And I was actually accepted there as well. That's that slide. Now we are going to be walking through the first paragraph of my personal statement, and I honestly could spend an, an entire webinar focusing on this uh, part of the application, but um, in 5,300 characters, you're supposed to respond to the prompt, which says, uh, use the space provided to explain why you want to go to medical school, which is very, very broad with good reason, um, and I'm going to be we're going to read through the first paragraph that I have here before you, and then we're going to talk a little bit about you know, some strategy and what I did here. Um, but I wrote, on my 15th birthday, I was notified that my juvenile work permit was approved. It was one of the greatest gifts I had ever received. With this, I joined my family beneath the unrelenting sun, tending to the great fields that span across the world's most fertile basin, California's San Joaquin Valley. This place is where my family first settled after immigrating to the United States in the 1940s. My grandfather was one of 4,211 Mexican nationals selected for the Bracero program, which intended to inexpensively meet manual labor demands in exchange for fair wages, housing, and a chance at achieving the American dream. However, history books and ongoing litigation illustrate conflicting stories. For decades, farm laborers have, braced, have braved harsh environmental conditions, health taxation, and social injustices in an unforgiving agricultural industry that often favors revenue over one's health. As a first-generation college-educated Latino, my passion for becoming a physician was born from the plight of America's braceros, their existence on the margins of the U.S. healthcare system and the exploitative work conditions that more accurately detail the adversity of the shared farm labor experience. So the reason why I wanted to use my initial paragraph is because uh, I used a hook, and that is basically a stream of sentences that capture the reader's interest. Keep in mind that the personal statement is the longest uh, part of your application or the longest uh, text that is typed out. And uh, also remember that the reviewers are human. They are going to be reading through thousands of personal statements. Um, and it's important that you know they at least make it through your initial paragraph. Usually if they make it through the first paragraph and if it's strong, they uh, will uh, have, um, they will continue to stay interested in the rest of the uh, uh, story that you've laid out for them. You want to use symbolic language, um, and by that you mean you want to engage the senses like touch, smell, sight. And the way that I did this, I actually circled back and connected with my high school English professor who I had a really good relationship with. Um, obviously, he's an expert in writing, so um, I, he uh, helped me um, use uh, symbolic, um, uh, uh, symbolic language and, and imagery um, in order to kind of help spice up my, this, this uh, personal statement. You also want to make sure that you answer the question. So right here, again, it's very broad. Use the space to, to explain why you want to go to medical school. Where a lot of applicants fall short is they end up writing about what they want to do as a physician. But that's not what the personal statement is about. So just make sure that you're writing about why you specifically want to medical school, what life experiences have contributed and driven you to uh, get to where you are at, um, at this point in your life. And uh, also, I recommend having a limited number of people who know you and who are willing to provide honest feedback. Um, now, moving on to the don'ts. Um, so, don't restate your resume. This is not a, a an opportunity where you just talk about every. I know, um, obviously, talk about work and, and experiences that have impacted you, but you don't want to talk about um, stuff that you've already highlighted in your work and activity section. But keep in mind, for me. I, I wrote about working in, in the fields in my work and activity section, but it was actually most memorable. And I really wanted to kind of, uh, um, it really has a lot to do with my story and why I want to be a physician. So it's okay if you include something like that. Um, be careful with writing about sensitive topics that may make the make feel the reader uncomfortable. So it's great, you know, if, if you, um, well, if you've ever been through a traumatic experience, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you've also been able to overcome that experience and be 
willing to write about it and share with other people, um, that's that's also great. But just keep in mind that you don't know who is on the other side uh, of reading your personal statement. If it's something that they're uh, re- if they're reading something that they're you know that they can relate to personally to an extreme degree that can you know trigger them emotionally, that's just an easy way for someone uh, who's reading this to get you know kind of turned off. And um, you know you would hope that they don't take the initiative and have someone else read your personal statement but in often cases it could be where uh they they don't and that's just one uh one thing that i would be uh careful um, when it comes to sharing uh, such personal information and again obviously don't wait for the last minute to write your personal statement uh, and in addition to all the other uh, writing that you have to do in the work activities and also the disadvantage essay which we'll talk next on the next slide so the disadvantage essay, I want to rebrand it as a context essay. And basically what it is, it offers a new lens through which your application can be uh, looked at or reviewed. It's short, it's only 1,300 characters. And um, you actually, you know, you, know you, you talk about, you know, all the obstacles that you've had to overcome when, you know, that, um, on your path to medicine. Um, examples that I used was being first generation, being an English as a second language learner, growing up um, impoverished, um, having a father who was incarcerated, um, and you know there are other you know this is uh, that list is not um, all inclusive. Like there are plenty of other things that uh, in which that you can in- include, and, um, and also that's shout out to Kiran who's uh, pictured on the right. Uh, she looks great, and I'm so happy that we included her on this. But um, also this essay, you really want to uh, answer the question like who are you, and you really use this space to show the distance you have traveled. Uh, that's actually a quote that I heard from a Stanford a medical school administrator. Show the distance that you have traveled in, not only in your disadvantaged essay, but in your personal statement as well. Um, so I would highly recommend that you try doing that. Um, this is a section where you tell them like it is. So if you grew up in a single parent household with little to no food in your refrigerator, say that. If you grew up and you were on food stamps, say that. Um, if you grew up in a home where your mother was in, wasn't a U.S. citizen and she didn't want to get food stamps because she feared not being able to uh, become a citizen in the future, say that. Um, um, if you were a teenager who had to take care of their three siblings while your mom and dad were at work and that somehow impacted your ability to uh, um, to get good grades, say that. Um, this is. It, it, I will say that you want to be careful and make sure you write in a way that doesn't come off as wanting to be pitied, but you also, this is a place where you can just be really upfront and talk about the, um, the pitfalls or the obstacles that you face in your life that have prevented you. Uh, um, but that, and that even despite these obstacles, you've still, you know, gotten to the point where you're applying to medical school. Now to discuss the not so fun parts of applying. So the cost, uh, there are obviously costs associated with applying to medical school, and we'll run through this schematic quickly. So in 2019, um, there were an average of 17 primary applications uh, submitted per person. That amounts to about $842. So in addition to, um, say, so you apply it to 17 schools, 17 of those schools want to advance you to the second round, and they're going to send you 17 secondaries. Um, and each of those secondaries um, cost different. Some can be more than $100 just to submit it. Some can be as low as like 50. So on average, uh, they cost about $75 each. So 17 applications times 75, that's uh, $1,275 in addition to the 842. And then you also have to factor in if all goes well with the pandemic and we hopefully are able to live in a world where we don't have to mask and we can go back to in-person interviews, you're gonna have to consider paying for a hotel and if you're anyone like me who loves to eat uh, really good food um, those steak dinners end up adding a lot so um, that's at minimum you're going to be spending about two thousand one hundred and seventeen dollars um, just for the primary and secondary applications um, it's um, if you want to really um, play with the number of schools or the math there's actually a cost simulator that you can use i included it at the bottom and again we'll provide you with these links so you can kind of gauge uh, and estimate how much money it is that you're going to need to um, apply to medical school. Next slide. So if you are someone uh, like me, initially I uh, applied for something called the fee assistance program, otherwise known as FAP. If you don't make a lot of money um, or if your parents don't, you can apply for the fee assistance program. You submit your parents' tax documents. Um, and for myself, uh, for me, since I was working, I had to submit mine as well. You can offset the cost. So we're gonna run through the five um, 
product, um, benefits that you get if you get approved. Um, but in total, they all add up to about $1,586 in savings, which in all reality is doesn't entirely offset the exorbitant amount that it costs to apply, but it is it can be a huge help for, for a lot of people. Uh, the first benefit that you get is you get um, the official prep products for the MCAT from the double AMC. The double AMC is the makers of the MCAT. So you actually, if, if you pay about $300, you get practice material from them as well, which is um, unfortunate. You know, this ser uh, that service in and of itself should be free, but um, for most people, it's not. If you get fee, ass fee assistance, it is. Uh, the second is you get a, a reduced, not a, not a free MCAT registration. Um, initially it's 325 with FAP, it's $130. And that's $130 every time you take it. Um, the third step, uh, the third benefit is you get a complimentary two-year subscription to the MSAR. And that's the database that I talked about when we were um, discussing how to select which schools to apply to. That in, in and of itself is $36 in value. The fourth benefit is you get a waiver for all MCAS fees for the one primary application submission uh, up to 20 medical schools. So that's $987, almost $1,000 uh, that you get for free. So 20 medical schools, uh, 20 primary applications that you can submit for free. But keep in mind, if you get 20 secondaries from those schools, you're gonna have to, there's no uh, pay, uh, payment assistance for that. Unless you reach out to the schools uh, um, in individually, which I highly recommend if you are on FAP and you get secondaries from these schools, definitely email them out. I know there's been, uh, there are lots of situations in which these schools will waive these fees and actually uh, give them to you for free or, or even uh, reduce them. The last benefit is a waiver for the double AMC preview situational judgment exam. That is something that is, they're still piloting. It, it, I'm not sure exactly how uh, schools are uh, looking or incorporating it into their um, admissions decision, but I think on a surface level, they're making everyone take this uh, online situational judgment test. They like give you scenarios and you either have to respond to the camera or you uh, have to type out uh, your responses as to what you would do. Um, that costs about $100, but with FAP, it's about um, 100. And as we conclude this presentation, we do have third-party resources that, uh, that I recommended. Um, they have been an incredible help. Please, uh, obviously, like we have something like YouTube, which is a great resource, not only for the MCAT, but there's also Dr. Gray's uh, YouTube channel, um, which he really he does a much better job of explaining the application process than me. Um, and then we do have uh, social networks like Mi Mentor and also Central Valley Scholars, which are incredible resources to leverage, um, and especially in a place and at times when applying to medical school can be uh, sometimes lonely and it can be difficult. It's great to know that you can rely on other people in your community uh, to uh, who are also going through this experience as well. And that's pretty much all that I have uh, for everyone. Um, when I just go to the last slide, I, I want to say, Thank you to those who not only signed up, but actually came to this presentation. It's been a great opportunity being able to share this information for you, but I now want to open this discussion for Q&A and uh, thanks for tuning in. Well, I wish we could all see your faces because I'd love to have a round of applause for that incredible presentation by Hector. Um, before I go ahead and jump into the Q&A, um, I'm gonna drop the link to our feedback survey. Um, and this feedback survey by filling it out, you can get entered to win um, a $50 gift card or prize. Um, it'll be totally randomized. So yeah, go ahead, 